I could start. Okay. I'm resident of Colorado Jewel Stage for YouTube. No, I have no control over my own show, uh, and I never will. Uh, this is my buddy Butch Rosenbaum. <laughs> and this is my buddy Patrick McCray. We're here to do a Christmas movies from our Christmas list, me and Patrick's Christmas list. And we are doing On Her Majesty's Secret Service, a James Bond movie, which stars George Lazenby. Uh, Diana Riggs is her name, I think, is the Bond girl in this movie. Riggs. She's very underrated. Yeah. Very. She well, is. Um, well, she, she, she's very well respected. <clears throat> She's, she was considered one of England's preeminent actresses yeah. um, in her era. And she was the host of Mystery. And of course, she was uh, she was the uh, she was the original uh, Uma Thurman in the Avengers. Yeah. So to speak. That would be, that she would played be... Emma Peel in the Avengers, the real Avengers. Uh, yeah. That would be for yeah. you, Joel. That would be Lady so, Diana Rigg. Yes, yes. She, uh, she, she's a bit ahead of her time as a Bond girl because she's not. She does become a damsel in this movie, but she's not just a damsel in this movie. She sort of kicks ass in this movie sure. a bit. She, she, uh, you know, yeah. You, you, you smell her boot. You're gonna know what Telly Savalas had for lunch. <laughs> what did you think um yeah telly savalas who is famous for playing kojak Which he's playing uh blowfield in this movie what did you guys think it, they replaced donald pleasance with terry savalas what did you guys think if they had combined telly savalas's two greatest roles you would have gotten something that doesn't sound very savory you would have gotten blowjack Is Butch frozen down there? What's happened? Or is he just maintaining the world's greatest poker face I've ever seen? I can't tell. Butch, you froze no. here. No, I, the Emma. I can see you, so you're good. Yeah, we can see you. You're just very still. You're you're like the the ninja in that way. You're you're the Shokasui of Bond commentary. Oh, thank you, sir. My my sound is acting a little funny, so I'm quietly yeah. Trying, see, I'm I'm things, so I don't want to mute because I'm not interrupting. Okay. Um, so low jack. <laughs> yeah, he... I don't dance. This is it. He <laughs> <laughs> does um, witty commentary. Uh Tell us about On Her Majesty's Secret Service, Patrick. Yeah. Why are you asking me? Because I just watched it for the first time this week. I'll jump in afterward. I want to hear about it from you. I want to hear what you had to say. Um, You know, as I admitted last week, I had not seen this before. I'd seen bits and pieces so many Bond fans just, you know, if Sean Connery is in it, it's, it, it was to be the greatest. It's, it's one of the greatest without him. Um, I guess for me, I say I grew up watching uh, Roger Moore and then I discovered Sean Connery. And then it's like, wait, wait, there's a guy that made one. What? So, um, yeah. tried to sit down and watch it. Uh, you know, it's it's kind of funny in that it's still very 60s, but you're starting to see the 70s, or at least what I would think of the 70s kind of creeping in. Yeah. Um, there's times. Yeah. Uh, well, it's not like editing in the. <clears throat> there's 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 times when I think Lazenby is it Lazenby or Lazenby? Ah, uh, yes. Okay. I, I don't really know. I've heard it pronounced both ways. Sometimes okay. by the man himself. <laughs> so I am. I don't know. I don't know. Um, I'm making a hooker. I got to take you with me. You go ahead. 
there's times I think he nails it and he does a fantastic job in his acting. And there's times I think he's a little wooden. Uh, maybe he's, maybe those were filmed early or, and he's still, or he's still finding his way. Um, he did much better than I thought. Well, yeah. Uh, it, you know uh, how much acting he had done before this movie? I don't think any had he. He had done, he had, <clears throat> he had like walked around with a, a, a like crate on his shoulder full of chocolate coming off a boat like uh you know as a commercial mascot and that was it so yeah he had done practically nothing his greatest acting in fact was how he swaggered his way into uh cubby's office uh and uh and kind of pushed his way in there and um and yeah, he he just he just charmed his way into the audition. So you know, kind of like Anthony Perkins, because God, they have a lot in common. Kind of like Anthony Perkins, he's a guy who had no acting training. You know, I mean, was, he was a natural. Uh, and uh, and what you see, for better or worse, is what he gives you. I think when I watched this movie back again. I noticed some things about it that I didn't notice about it before. Like, some of the way this movie, I feel like for Lazenby's, some of his one-liners is gone. You don't fully hear because he's walking out the room, and I think it's just the way this movie's edited. It's like... Uh, Well, yeah, that's... The sound editing... And the the visual editing have to be two different things, because believe it or not, this was directed by the guy who had edited all the prior Bond films. So oh. Peter Hunt, yeah, Peter Hunt knew what he was doing in that department. Uh, but the sound mix is a little weird, you know. Yeah. Uh, you know, we're going from from I think I think this was probably released in stereo, but that wasn't to be taken for granted. Uh, they're still getting used to how to mix that. And there's a lot of weird sound stuff, like in that that fight scene in the hotel. Or no, it's the fight scene right outside of uh, uh, Tracy's father's office. Yeah. Which one? Boom, 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 boom. Or maybe that's in the hotel. It, all these really, you know, I mean, you know, the the black exploitation genre called. They want their sound effects back. Um, you know, basically, it, it had a very drive-in quality. And maybe that's what he was going for, or you know, one of these. I've always wanted to use these sound effects. This is what it sounds like in my head, and you know, finally I get to use it. And but yeah, there's a few yeah. things where it's like, okay. Well, here's a weird thing about the sound in the movie. Uh, y- you know, Joel, you, you you might realize this, you might not. Uh, uh, y- you know that uh, that's not George Lazenby acting in the movie for about a quarter of it. Really? Yeah. Yeah, the whole time when he is Sir Hillary Bray, uh, that is um, that's the lovely and talented George Baker, do, who was the actor who played Hillary Bray, who's doing that voice. So whenever he's if, if he's got a skirt on, it's George Baker's voice is coming out of him. Interesting. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's that's why. He's so remarkably good as Sir Hillary Bray. It's eerie uh, because mm-hmm. they just got George Baker to play it. Now, George Baker, I think, shows up in Spy Who Loves Me as one of the, the admiralty, you know, because that's a very naval movie. Uh, he was just one of these actors like Shane Rimmer that, what a, what a name, uh, that, that you know, uh, Cubby liked a lot and used a lot. Uh, but, Joel, now you could see if you wanted to watch the greatest television series ever made, I, Claudius, you would see him as, and Butch, this will save it for you, Tiberius. Mm. And he's really good as Tiberius. I mean, that's an important character for uh, really the first part of that that TV series. And he's magnificent in it. And he wrestles, Jewel. You get to see him wrestle. There's a wrestling scene <laughs> with a medicine ball. Listen, as long as, listen, does he cut a good promo? Because, listen, CM Punk on Raw just 
did not. He would get his mother, played by Sean Phillips in the movie, to cut the promo. Okay. Yeah. 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 I, I liked it. But with this, now there's a scene in this movie where there is a fight scene in the hotel with the uh, with her father's bodyguard or her bodyguard, and Lesbi knocks him out. And when he's like, he bends over and he says something, and you sort of barely hear him. And then when he's walking out the room, he says something, and then you really don't really hear him that well. I'm thinking, who the hell edited this movie for sound? Because if you, if well, you, if you would, if you had been able to hear him clearly, you would have thought he was talking out of his ass. Yeah. <laughs> That's why you always turn the captions on, Joel. <laughs> I, LARP. I I admit I should have turned the captions on because I couldn't hear what he was saying and I had my volume turned up to a hundred. It's like Joel, maybe that's why. Maybe that was distorting the sound. You're not supposed to have your volume up that Joel, I'll tell you what. I've seen we, we may be entering Z-Man territory. I don't know. I've seen this movie a bunch and I understand the dialogue in it. I, I don't know. Maybe it's because I read the book. And by the way, as far as these adaptations go, uh, outside of Goldfinger and maybe from Russia with Love, uh, and of course Moonraker, this is the most faithful uh, adaptation. I'm kidding about Moonraker. Uh, this is very, very, very faithful to the book. It's 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 just nearly note for note. I heard I heard Moonraker, I heard Moonraker the book is better than Moonraker the movie. Are we talking about the Christopher Wood novelization, or are we talking about Ian Fleming's novel? I don't know. Just somebody said that the moon rate, the the book is better than the movie. Is that true or no? You know what? I could have eaten the book and passed it, and what came out of me could have been filmed, and it would have been better than that movie. <laughs> <laughs> He's he's not wrong. That you can tell uh, that they're like, hey, look, Star Wars was a hit. We need to have something in science. We need to have science fiction. We need to be out in space, and um, that's the one I usually call it. James Bond in space. There is a moment, Jewel. Have you not seen that movie? <clears throat> I've seen Moonraker. I've not read the novel. The novel is really funny. Uh, it's totally different than the book, and. Do you know how Bond gets to meet Hugo Drax? Mm. How the whole story starts? This is classic Fleming. This is what makes Ian Fleming so different from uh, from Jane Austen, um, if you were wondering. Uh, it's uh, M thinks that Drax is cheating at cards at his men's club. And so he brings in Bond to, to play cards with him a little bit and figure out how he's cheating. Yeah. So, so wow. you've read any of these Bond books? Did I read any of them? No, yeah. but I've seen the movies. I've seen you need the only one them. I haven't seen is the most recent sure. one. Well, neither have I. I refuse to see it. Butch, did you see it? Yes. How was it? I thought it was a fitting capstone to the Daniel Craig era. Oh, well, that, <laughs> I didn't know where you were going with that. Uh, at this point, you know, here's the funny thing. The longer the Daniel Craig era went, the more I like Daniel Craig and the less I like the movies he's in. Really? I think he, I think as a performer, he's great, especially when he doesn't have to be James Bond. If you if you watch Glass Onion or uh, Knives Out, you Knives basically out. get to see yeah. the lighthearted performance. From what I hear, he wanted to do something that was much more akin to Roger Moore. Because he's about our age, and that's when he grew up. Yeah. And that's what he was looking forward to doing. Little did he know mm. that this is the Bond who needs an antidepressant. This is really, and Bond needs one anyway, but good God. Uh, uh, I, I think something, I'm going to quote somebody that I agree with, and that is, even the worst Bond movie is still a James Bond movie. I mean... Who said that? <laughs> their, what's their address? 
<laughs> Joel saying Ed. <laughs> yeah, well, Kurt, listen. I do because agree that with wrong. <laughs> I'm just going to I'm just going to get a deal with it right now. That person is wrong. <laughs> Haven't watched Casino Royale 1967 and get back to me. I actually have watched that. Well, it's a great movie, but I don't know if it's a James Bond movie, even though they say the name James Bond more than any other film ever. No, it's not. I mean, it's a it's a weird, fun film. Okay, but it is. But let's talk about that for a second. I've never heard her talk, you know, on Her Majesty's Secret Service. But when they, I had seen Casino. By the time I had seen Casino Royale, because I did that, I had seen Casino Royale. Right after I saw Tomorrow Tomorrow Never Dies. Okay. And it was on it was on Turner Classic Movies, is when it was on is what it was on. And I watched it. Something I watched it and I'm like, okay, that was that was interesting. It was a tad different. And then you know, years later we get we get Daniel Craig, and, and what's the first what's the first Bond movie they announce? Casino Royale. Like, well, there are past legal reasons for that. Okay, but as as a Bond fan, did you find that strange at all? No, it was it was the other shoe finally falling. See, uh, he he had Ian Fleming had entered into different agreements with different people to make Bond stuff prior to Cubby and Harry. And so he had sold the rights to CBS, I think, the film rights. And that kept trading hands until it wound up with Columbia, and then Columbia became Sony. And they they, through some court battles, they managed to get it back from Charles Feldman's family. And so it this was the last Bond novel title. They still have some some short stories so if you ever want the thrilling 007 property of a lady uh you know they could still they could still make that uh i'm surprised they haven't made one called thrilling cities um but uh which is a great book by the way uh but the yeah so we as bond fans i mean like i'm a hardcore fan of casino royale 1967 i think it's a riot it has nothing to do with James Bond. It's just a big, goofy mess of a movie directed by five different people. You know, Orson Welles and Billy Wilder secretly being two of the other directors. I mean, like the story of making that movie is amazing. Anyway, but it was this missing jewel in the Thanos glove of, you know, Bond. So it finally, the stone finally went in with that. Ava Green is great in that movie. She's beautiful. Um, <laughs> she is. She's no Lauren Green. No. Uh, well, let, but, hey, let, let me ask you this before we go further. What is your least favorite Bond film? Oh, my God. My least favorite Bond film. Oh, my God. Probably Moonraker. Probably that one. Because... <laughs> It's just like, why? It felt like, look, anytime a franchise goes into space, I don't mind that because, hey, number one, that's imagine it. Because it's not like the Bond films hadn't really gone into space before, but this story more centered around it than any of the others. Like, you saw, like, okay, you only live, uh, you only live twice. Like the rockets, like capturing the other one into space and like taking. Okay, so you're you're like you're wondering. Okay, is Bond ever gonna go into space? And Moonraker answers that for you. If you you know if you if you're waking up out of a coma tomorrow and you've never heard of the Bond franchise, are you starting somebody off with Moonraker? No, probably yeah. not. But at the same time, you have to explain to somebody, look franchises no matter what take risk for example halloween 3 season of which that was a risk john carpenter wanted to do an anthology that was the first real risk in the franchise um and people didn't like it 
people love it now, but it took, then. it took a long time for people to accept that movie for what it what it was. And growing up, I would hear, you know, it's not a good film. I'm like, what what film did you watch? Because clearly we didn't watch the same one. Moonraker is not going to be that movie that you defend. It's it's a James it's Bond a movie, for better or worse, no matter what. So that's why I agree with the guy who said, you know, a, a, a bad James Bond movie is still a James Bond movie at the end of the day. That was, that was true until the day ended. <laughs> It's true until the day ended, and then the day ended somewhere around uh, Spectre. Uh, In fact, I, honestly, that the day ended probably around. Uh, um, oh, what the hell was that thing they made for the anniversary? Skyfall with Madonna. With Madonna. Die another day. Die yeah, another day. That, that's on my list. Yeah, that I mean, number. for um, me. However, Die Another Day is Honor Majesty's Secret Service compared to Spectre, which for me privately, I, I can't even cite details about it because I was so disgusted with it. I saw it once. Uh, at that time, I had not yet really started hardcore walking out of movies. So I was too busy sleeping through them. Um, but the parts of Spectre I saw were privately for me not only the worst James Bond film ever made, but one of the worst movies I had ever seen. It was, and and for me, a movie, this is the measure of a bad movie. A, if I don't want to see it again, and I really don't want to see that again. Uh, two, A and then two. Uh, the the other thing is, Ed Wood and guys like that, Hersh Gordon Lewis didn't make bad movies. They were doing the best with what they had and they did it with a lot of heart and a lot of enthusiasm and they loved the process and that's infectious. Um, so get a shot and have it cleared up. Um, but then you get a movie like, Oh, I don't know, uh, Mulholland drive or, uh, something like that where everyone involved in the movie knew better and it's still wretched. Everyone knew better. The, the 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 guy at craft services knew better than to make anything that was inspector and yet they made it that makes a bad movie and to have come off of maybe not the greatest bond film ever skyfall it's not that because bond just keeps screwing up through the whole film and that's the only way the movie moves forward is the bond fails at things which i think is on purpose i don't know uh but it still is one of the most interesting Bond movies ever made. I mean, it does a lot of weird stuff, and it's got a lot of moody, moody stuff in it that, you know, I can buy. Uh, to go from that, where they finally end our postmodern nightmare that had been going on since 1995 by giving me my padded door back, you know, and uh, and I hate to say it, but a gentleman as M, uh, who seems to like Bond, because uh, it took Judy Dench, you know, eight or nine movies to finally warm up to Bond. Um, uh, to go from that to whatever the hell Spectre was, I don't even know. Um, forget it. Forget it. And Brofeld is all I can say. Sure, let's make Blofeld Bond's brother. Why? What does that, What what is Odd Job going to be his aunt? I mean, is he related to everybody? I'm what a what a just a just just a dumb wasteful move. And Christopher Walt, such an interesting actor, such a boring Blofeld. Have you what, seen what, uh, uh, Have you seen him in the Django Unchained? Yeah, it's fascinating. He's not playing Blofeld in that film. Yeah, good movie. I would have much rather have seen him from Django Unchained somehow turned Bond villain, having traveled through time, than to see Blofeld. I'm really mad about that thing. I hate that movie. Well, technically, they don't turn him into his brother because his his Blofeld's parents adopted James Bond. That's even stupider. Yeah, I, no, I get it, but it's it's like the Brady Bunch. 
no, I get what you're saying, but like he's not he's not his brother. Are, but it right. is sort of like it's like okay, so you murdered your parents because they adopted this kid. <laughs> <laughs> it's like what the <clears throat> and it makes Blofeld less competent. Yeah. It makes him this weird, petty, kind of rumple stiltskinian figure rather than Donald Blank and Pleasance, you know, with the scar and the cat and the rocket or Charles Gray, Mycroft Holmes, god damn it. And and just uh, even Telly Savalas, who loves you, baby, I do. Yeah. Who would if you who would you if you could have changed the blowfield then how would you have done it? I just would have had him be blowfield. Yeah. Just a just he is the, the ultimate Bond villain. And the ultimate Bond villain means he's good at being a Bond villain. That's his you know, you have one job, Blofeld. You have one job, and that's to that's to run Spectre. Not to also be a source of family angst and a jealous Adopted brother. Mm. I mean, seriously, who thought that was a good idea? Not me. Sam Mendes, I guess. The, the, the same people who thought it was a good idea that Dave Batista could act. I mean, what do you do? Um, Dave Batista, as an actor, is Lawrence Olivier compared <laughs> to the writing of Blofeld Inspector. His stunt work is, that's for sure. Uh, but you he's know, a wrestler. That's the thing, though. He's a wrestler, though. He knows how to take a bump. The thing, the thing with with Blofeld and, and Bond being <clears throat> even adopted brothers, it goes it, to me. It, it always it right away, and it still makes me think of when they made uh, Jack Napier slash the Joker be the person that killed Bruce Wayne's yeah. parents. We don't. I don't know who. Where in Hollywood this we have to tie the villains to get the, the our two characters together and make this conflict more personal? No, you don't. Mm-hmm. It's one thing if it if it's inherently in the in in that story you're telling. Yeah, I'm not thinking anything right off the top of my head. But to bring it in together and and tie that for some stupid reason, no. World War II was completely compelling without Hitler being revealed as FDR's brother. Oh my god. Yeah, I mean I, I hear what you're saying. I, I agree with you. I don't I don't love the idea of him being his adopted brother. Like who gives a shit? Because now well, it, it trivializes everything. Well, okay. It's like, it's just a family bat. Well, if it, and if he's so upset with his parents adopting Bond, why doesn't he just kill Bond? I mean, I mean, when they're kids, not all the stuff that had gone on two or three movies, just, you know, we're skiing, push, oh, oh my God, James tripped, oh my God, he's dead. Yeah, yeah. So he comes off as a petulant single child, uh, who sent the, his mom and dad are centered on him, and, and uh, now I have to Irwin share. Kirchner. I blame Erwin Kirshner. Yeah. Suddenly, everybody has to be related. You know, I'm going to tell you something about that movie. I'm going to take a bold stance. The line that they shot would have made an infinitely more interesting sequel. I was watching a video talking about that, and I was thinking the same thing. And his and, and Luke's reaction makes more sense. Obi-Wan killed your father. Oh, my God, my trusted surrogate father killed the other one? What's going on? And what a mystery to have to unravel. This is like uh, like odd job saying, oh, by the way, Mr. Bond, I'm your father. And and Bond would go, well, that's weird. OK, I'm still going to kill you. I mean, Sorry, I, I, Luke's reaction, he has very little invested in Vader. Mm. He, he glimpsed him once and, and then had the weird dream. And that's it. He knew Obi Wan. He loved Obi Wan. Yeah. What a great line for that movie. Mm-hmm. 
And I, then you don't have to do the who can lay our brother and sister, that which is brain damaged. Anyway, we get us back on track, Joel. What, why? What, I've never done a good job of it before. Uh, you love the cricket, <laughs> Jewel. You love the sound of their voice. Well, here's, here's, I want to touch on some things about before I get this back on track. That if they, with Spectre, if they had, if, because if you're looking to recapture the magic of the original movies and bring back Spectre, you don't have to reveal Blofeld in this movie. Like well, he, they had they had been building that up for like three or four films. Well, I know, but I know they had. How been many more movies are you going to give them? This I would have I would have gave it this movie and then yet another movie and then reveal Blowfield, but not as Bond. Standing up on grave. What's that, Steve? If you gave him that movie and then the next one before you reveal him as Blowfield, Bond's Bond's dead. Because he dies in the next one inexplicably. Well, I wouldn't have killed Bond, obviously. That's okay, good. But now we're cooking well, with gas. That's that's what I'm saying. I wouldn't have killed James Bond off in the next movie. If you're gonna if you're gonna do I know they've been teasing Spectre throughout since the beginning of this, you know, series with Daniel Craig, but you can still you don't have to reveal Blofeld in the movie called Spectre. You can build up, you can say, okay, there's here's this group, here's Spectre, and who's their leader? We don't know who their leader is. We, we no one's ever laid eyes on him, other than the most trusted circle of circles, and that's it. He couldn't it's have like, been better hidden than if he were a cast member of Mad TV. It's it's like. It's like an evil version, almost an evil version of the shadow, in a sense, where no one's seen it. Like, very few people have seen him, if any. And then after Spectre, Bond finds the one clue, the one way to get to this guy by the end of Spectre, and then the next movie. You know who you make him in that case? Who's that? Ray Fiennes. Yeah, I could see that. Ooh, that that's M... Jesus Christ. Yeah. And, and like all this weirdness with MI6 going downhill and being defunded. And then, yeah. Yeah. yeah that's who you reveal. That's the big, oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would be okay with it. Now, now we'll get back on track to on Her Majesty's Secret Service. I really feel like diamonds are. Diamonds are forever gets too much credit for being having this woman be this tough woman. I think Diana Briggs deserves a lot more credit than what she gets because she kicks some ass in this movie and I love it. I think you know when I, you look at on Her Majesty's Secret Service, the stunt work is really good. I love the odd camera angles you get in the fight sequences in this movie. It's really cool. It makes you feel like you're the one fighting the villains at times. The way they shoot it, it feels. Well, you have an editor directing the movie. Yeah. You know, and the gloves are off. Yeah. Literally. They do make, you're right, and they go down beneath the hotel to meet the girl's father, and there is, like, this weird sound of fighting, as Butch pointed out, too. It's, it's really strange. It's a strange sound, but you know what? It works for this movie, though. Not as strange as the little person who's whistling the themed Goldfinger <laughs> as, he's, as he's sweeping down there. That Talk about a weird sound. That's the movie at its most meta. I don't care about this never happened to the other fella. That moment. It, if I were Bond, I would wonder, what, what did I have at the buffet? Oh, those oysters. It's a bad idea. Oh. <laughs> what, what's you guys' favorite scene in this movie? Much. Favorite scene. Um, I don't know. Let me get back to you on that. I will say, well, we all know what the the, uh, the scene is because uh, my wife had never seen this and she was watching it with me. And she's like, I didn't know James Bond got married. Yeah. I just kind of looked out the corner of my eye and I said, 
and he says that we have all the time in the world. And I looked at her and I said, there's a reason why you don't say that. Well, and watch, I was watching her face when that scene happened. You know what and you got to show her now is for your eyes only. Yeah, at the beginning. Beginning, because it says they had all the time in the world on her tombstone. And, uh, well, I, I want to also do uh, the beginning of Diamonds Are Forever, where when Connery's back and he, you know, they're, they're, he, no, we ain't playing, we ain't playing around at the, at the beginning when he's one chance was blow. Fa- I mean, no cute lines, no bullshit. Answer my question or you're going to die. Follow that up with, with the end or with the beginning of uh, License to Kill. Yeah. Which has some really good stuff at Felix and Della's wedding about, uh, about Teresa. Yeah. Yeah. Patrick, what's your favorite scene? All of them. I love this movie. I think it is a, a pretty serious Bond film. When they when they they were getting goofy, they were getting goofy. They were getting goofy with For Your Eyes Only, which I still you only live twice, which I still love. But you know, I'm the space capsules and so on. Um, uh, and then they got all of the stupid stuff that. Moonraker and so on get blamed for really started with Diamonds Are Forever. So you have this anomaly, which is, you know, it's a fairly kind of normal plan. We're going to use this allergy clinic to poison the world. Could happen. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it's, a, it's a pretty low key con- compared to like shooting into space from a volcano. It's It's like they had budget cuts. Mm-hmm. At Spectre, they had budget. In fact, they didn't even mention Spectre. He's just kind of mm-hmm. on his own with this one. So mm-hmm. I've had it with you guys. I'm going indie. I think he funded this through uh, through uh, you know like Patreon or something, and um, he, he crowdsourced it. Um, <laughs> but um, it, it could be great. Blowheld had a Patreon that you could be a member of. Uh, the top tier, you get to live. Um, <laughs> <laughs> But uh, tell us your neighborhood. We won't release the virus there. Um, the Chick-fil-A is okay. You, you're going to get a little hungry on Sunday. Buy some extra nuggets the day before. Um, but uh, but other than that, I love this movie. I think it's a very serious film. The fact that Lazenby only plays Bond once makes it feel, I know this is going to sound weird, it makes it feel like I'm watching James Bond. Yeah. Because I don't have, he's not, Oh, that's Roger Moore as James Bond. Oh, that's Sean Connery as James. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's Timothy Dalton. It's no. It's it's kind of like the, the, the effect that Daniel Craig had in his first movie, which is like, okay, I don't have any other associations with this guy, and and I like that. Um, it it adds both to the realism and yet strangely the surreality of the film. Uh, I think Blofeld. This is the most credible of the Blofelds. Savalas is intelligent enough to, I can believe he, he came up with this weird scientific plan, but he also seems like a character that even though he and Bond don't go to fisticuffs, he could make, and Bond, of course, is going to win, but he could make Bond's life very difficult in that fight scene because Savalas is a very athletic guy. Right. And, you know, he's going up against this big Greek. Good luck. Um, so, uh, I think I buy the whole romance. I, I love that the movie never feels slow, but it does take its time that Bond does have this little weird side adventure where he's just trying to do right by, uh, by Teresa. And, and, and I think the father is such an endearing character He's exactly the guy you want to see as James Bond's father-in-law. And he's the one father-in-law James Bond would respect, you know? Uh, And you can credibly see, because I think when he's talking about, yeah, I'm going to quit all this, I think in the back of Bond's mind, he's I'm just going to go to work for her father. Uh, You know, because he's an honorable thief. And you see that in the wonderful dialogue that he and M have at the wedding where Emma is saying, you know, how did you pull that one off? You know, it, it, when they're wandering away. And it's just it's just so quietly charming. The Bond is scared 
a few places, and that's okay because he still handles the situation. But you can see that even Bond has his limits. You know, when that that you know, I mean, if you've escaped peace, glory, and all this other stuff, what's going to freak you out? A polar bear with a camera on ice skates. Again, that's going to like, and Bond goes, ah! <laughs> which, which is he's ready for odd job. He's not quite ready for that. Um, and it just shows that he's kind of at his limits there. Um, oh. I just, God damn it. I love the whole thing. And the, and the death scene for a guy who never acted. Oh, Lazenby's just so, so pure. He's so, so clean with this. And, um, and, you know, most of the, most of the people involved in the making of the movie have have said that if Lazenby had continued, that he would have been every bit Connery's equal, you know, by Spy Who Loved Me or something like that. Mm-hmm. And I I think you know, as Bond, not as a charming you know figure of pop culture, but as Bond. And I think I think they're they're probably right. Mm-hmm. Um, Lazenby got, got screwed by his agent, who quit him. Mm-hmm. He quit Lazenby when Lazenby was away. Lazenby shows up and he says, I'm ready. And I said, well, your, your, your agent quit you. What? Well, I, I unquit me. Well, it's too late for that. Sorry. He had to pay to go around the world to promote the movie on his own. And part of it, this is like Cubby and Harry being so square. God love him. He had grown a beard. And they were terrified that the that the public would be confused. Oh no, we've got a new James Bond, and he's promoting the movie with a beard. Ah, oh, the communists have won. I mean, what? come on, guys, it's a beard. It's not like every man in the world doesn't have facial hair. <laughs> I'm sure there's times in his life James Bond had a beard. You know, when he maybe when he was recuperating after being shot up, and you know, yeah. Or is having an aquatic adventure like G.I. Joe? Joel, what's your favorite scene? <laughs> oh my god. In this movie, I love the 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 introduction of Diana's character. Just how they how they start this and her going into the water and you don't you don't see Lazenby right away until he gets out of the car and he saves her life. I know that sounds corny, but because it's like, is she a damsel? Like, what's what's going on here? It builds. J- Bond movies are really good at building mystery, and this is just another example of that. It's a, it does a really good job of building mystery of what's going on within the story. So that's Patrick my- hit a really good point that I, I want to expand upon just a bit. This is one of the last ones, and depend, I guess depending on your taste, you can include Diamonds Are Forever because I don't. As much as I grew up on on, on Roger Moore's, and 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 there's some of them I really love, Spy Who Loved Me. But there's a point when you're watching the Roger Moore's, it just gets so convoluted, and you're like, "What? What are we doing here? Why is Bond there? What's going on?" And you kind of don't care because there's a, some interesting things going on. This movie. Well, it's not strictly linear, it is linear. I mean, everything makes sense. He goes from here to go to here yes. because of this and that, as opposed to, well, well let's go over to Venice because we got some time to film over here. Now, let's go over here and go to the Bahamas because we've been there before. And you're like, the most ridiculous isn't even Roger Moore, it's the plot to one of my favorite Bond films that I still don't know what's going on in it, and that's Living Daylights. <sighs> There are diamonds, there's a heart, there's, there's like a, an organ transplant at one point that's in diamonds. You got Joe Don Baker running around with statues made of himself. The And then suddenly Al-Qaeda shows up as the good guys. What? What's going on? The, this film does not do that, it, thankfully. And... I, I, but I can maybe see where they they get the idea, like when they they're the when Bond and Tracy are hiding in the barn, and a few other scenes. And yeah, you're right. I, I was thinking, I'm like, you know, this is how you show characters falling in love without some 20 minute 
sappy Celine Dion video going on, and they're lovingly yeah. loving each other's in their eyes. and they do things that bond them. Uh, no, no pun intended, but I mean, but really, I mean, they do. And you want, and the stakes are high, and that's often how people fall in love. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna say something, and I, I'd like to get both of your opinions on this. Um, Lady Diana Rigg is quite possibly the most beautiful Bond girl woman in the whole franchise. She she may not have the physical ability characteristics of some people, but just the sheer beauty and class that she brings, she blows everybody else away. I mean, it's yeah. This is yeah. why he this is why he married her. She's number two on the list, and it's why he didn't marry the others. I mean, like let's face it. You know, Honor Blackman, you're great. You were also on the Avengers. But Yeah. Who's number one then, Joel? Oh, Ava Green. Okay. Really? Yeah. Really? She's absolutely stunning. Okay. Okay. But for <laughs> me, our, our reactions are the same, Butch. It's like to each <laughs> to each his own. Yeah, you know, it's I, I I mean, I remember when Terry Hatcher was announced for Tomorrow Never Dies. And I was like, oh, wow. You know, and she shows up, she hits her lines, but her and Brosnan have no chemistry and they hated each other, apparently. Really? So I think, yeah, I have read. Why? Pierce uh, is a nice guy. He's a widow. He He said, I'm sure. I think the, the, the only thing he said about her is I'm sure her mother loves her. Oh. And that will get. And he's not a guy to talk shit about people. And he's a no. classic guy. So if he if he goes there, you know, he probably would have preferred doing she love things with Vincent Steele. For what? being a, she has a reputation for being a diva. Really? Yeah. Sorry, Joel. Go ahead. No, no, that's that's crazy. That's I think if you if you get cast as a Bond girl or just James Bond in general. Be grateful for the role you get, you know. My God, um, there's there's a diff- now. She's I, I, go ahead. I'm sorry. There, there is. See, this is the thing. She wasn't cast as the Bond girl, which might have been what ticked her off. No, um, sure. There is a figure in almost all Bond films called the sacrificial lamb. Yeah, because Bond is a very aloof character. Bond is is nearly sociopathic. And Bond has very little invested personally in these jobs. It's literally a job, you know. Yeah, he gets to drink martinis and gamble, but he's clocking in. Um, and then someone helps him, and they get killed. Sometimes it's a guy, yeah, like VJ Armitage in uh, in Octopussy. But it's someone good. It's someone who is has a good heart, unlike Bond who has very little heart, and that's just a fact. Yeah. Um, and that's the thing that pisses Bond off so much that the rest of the movie is personal. And this happens in Bond film after Bond film after Bond film. It's part of the part of the ritual. And so Terry Hatcher was the sacrificial lamb. Yeah. I mean, she's coming off of the Superman series. Does she... If you get cast in a Bond film as a sacrificial limb, you're still in a Bond film. I know that, and you know that. Lois Lane, who thinks, oh, I'm in a Bond movie, I will be the Bond girl, and then reads the script and thinks this Hong Kong ballerina slash action star is it? Come on, guys, really? Yeah. Yeah, really. Yeah, she's a really good actress, and she's... She's smart and she's very sexy and she really acquit, you know, acquits herself very well. Terry, let's put you in that part and see how well you do. It's not happening. Yeah. But here's the funny thing: put Michelle Yeoh in as uh, as as Paris Carver, she'd be great. She could do either of those parts. Who would you like to see as a Bond girl? Now? Yeah. Oh, I I mean, um. Uh, I, I'm so behind on actresses. Um, I Butch, I don't know. Uh, I, 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 Karen Gillan. Oh, that's a good one. I'm, I'm looking up her name. Um, As the robot girl. 
Uh, no, no, no. Uh, <sighs> she's in the Book of Boba Fett. She was in the Mandalorian. She's oh, uh, a Gugino? No, that is it. Mina La Wing or something. I'm saying. I know. I'm not saying it right. Um, she was on. Others. She was on a. Uh, um, the Agents of Shields. Damn it! Here I've got it. Hold on. I'm sorry. No, it's <clears throat> Ming Na Win. Um. Yeah. 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 She um. She's. I've seen her in so many different things. I I don't wear the glasses as prominent because I don't have. I don't want the glare, but um. I, in me, she's she's very similar to to Michelle Yeoh, uh, not just because they're from that area, so, you know, similar area, but she could play she could play the sacrificial lamb, she could play the kick ass helper, and you know when um, which one is it with Halle Berry? And uh, that was um, yeah, uh, yeah, that was World is not enough. World, what is uh, maybe? That was that Halle Berry. I don't no, I don't think that was. But, no, uh, yeah. another day. She was uh, genius. Um, you know they wanted, They were talking about they wanted. She was so popular, and they were they wanted talking about spinning her off in her own film. It's like I don't care. Who are you, Kathleen but, Kennedy? Oh. No. But when you had Michelle Yeoh, yeah, I I I don't know that I would have been there opening night, but I would. That's a movie I would have watched. I would have wanted to see. Man. Joel. Man. Uh. Kelly who? I don't know. <laughs> That's not a bad choice. Okay. All right. I'm going I'm to take Jules' role. Who would you cast as Blofeld in a in a more modern Bond film? Uh, Three times. Both of you. Alfred Molina. That's a nice choice. I don't know. I may get off the elevator right there. Uh, I, I I would cast Derek Jacoby. You know, just just a really solid actor who can do anything. Twenty years ago, I became convinced Paul Dooley would make a great below field. I know you. Paul Dooley. Mm-hmm. Where did you get Paul? I I'm not arguing with you. That's Deep a Space Nine. Deep Space Nine. Deep Space Nine. Mm-hmm. Oh, Tane. Yes. And okay. Well, okay. Well, th- th- we've already seen him audition for the part. Get Avery Brooks. Mm. Oh. Ooh. Down Ooh. to the battle itself. Huh. Yeah. Oh, Avery Brooks would be great. Uh, great choice. Well, Avery Brooks is good no matter what. Who would you, okay, because they're going to do Bond again. Who would you cast as James Bond? At this point, considering what the producers are doing, someone I really hated, just as a punishment, I've lost faith completely. I don't know. I, you know, they're just going to fuck it up. Pardon my French. So I'm sorry. I hate to be that bitter about it. Um, You know, if I thought that competent people were making it, you know, like people making Strange New Worlds or something like that, who know how to have fun. Um, well, I, you know, I know you, you'd get that Thor guy. Um, Hemsworth? You, no, no, no. The, the Loki. Jewel, no. I bet you, yeah, no, Jewel would cast Adam Driver. Right? As a shadow, I would. Yeah. Okay, Jewel, really? who would you cast? Who would you cast? Really? Uh, as the, I would not cast Adam Driver as James Bond. I would cast Adam Driver as the shadow, uh, but not like to wear the to don the costume. To be clear, to don the the hat, the, the cloak, the guns. Yes, I've cast in Adam Driver for the shadow. Oh, you cast him as James Bond, but not as James Bond. Who are you James casting Bond? as James Bond, Jewel? No, I, I'm gonna try to uh, Nicholas Holt, the guy who was in Ren, Renfield. Didn't see it. Uh, I um, I, he he's borderline too old. 
I would I would bring in Henry Cavill just to audition him. I'm not saying I would cast him, but I would bring him into auditioning. I think it'd be I great. Think you need to get depending on you know his the age and whatnot. I, I think you need to look back to the previous guy. Get somebody that's maybe not super well known or even that well known, but is a good actor, kind of young, kind of hungry, and and bring them in. And I I, I don't. I will say this is something I believe, and you know, uh, at the bottom of my heart, and and I, paper, you guys may disagree with it, and that's perfectly fine. But whoever plays James Bond needs to be from Britain, Ireland, Wales, Australia. Yeah. I don't care. Right. Not yeah. an American. Never an American. I, that doesn't work for me. If you could cast, if you could cast somebody as a villain, it doesn't have to be a known villain. Who would you cast? As the villain? Yeah, it could be anybody. Uh, Judd Hirsch. I don't know. Um, um, I, it, it would depend on who the villain was, like which, which one we're talking about. I, I mean, just any number of good. At a certain point, it becomes kind of generic. For me, especially you look at a character like Blofeld, played by such a diverse range of actors, you know. So I, I who would you get as a Bond villain? Butch? Um, you just mentioned Tom Hiddleston, Loki, because Loki always loses, and and I want him. To, I, I like him as an actor. Okay, I cannot stand the character of Loki. I, I've read too many Thor comic books and and everything to ever like the character of Loki. So I want to see him, you know, get his just desserts. And he's a really good actor. And I, I think he could, you know, he could make a good young Blofeld. Well, no, he's not quite so young anymore, but a younger Blofeld. And, you know, make you love to hate him. If I were, if I were writing a James Bond story, I would do it sort of the opposite of how the shadow does it it would be a villain who could assume any identity including mi6 agents and i would cast andrew lincoln to play the villain okay. yeah yeah instead of playing the hero all the time like he does in the walking dead uh but <laughs> rick's not the hero well he was that's a whole nother discussion we're what who in this film on Our Majesty's Secret Service that we've tiptoed around and at times ignored, who, in your two opinion, who puts forth the best job? Who 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 does their who plays their role the best? Diana Rigg. Diana Rigg. <clears throat> Diana. Yeah, Diana. I, I agree that it is Diana Rigg number one because she's. Diamonds are forever doesn't deserve the credit for all. Oh, here's the tough girl, new attitude. No, Diana Rigg was first. She, yes, she becomes a damsel in this movie. Don't get me wrong. But she kicks ass in this movie too and doesn't get enough credit for it. But if I had to put in order Rigg, Lazenby, and Blofeld, oh, everybody knows their role. Like, no question, but number one's the woman. Okay. <clears throat> what about you, Butch? Um, yeah, Lady Diana Rigg. Uh, she, there's other Bond girls, and I hate that, I hate that term, but we know what we're talking about. Um, maybe they're, arguably more attractive or they're this or they're that she's a fantastic a actress um classy she comes across as kick-ass but by the same time incredibly broken on the inside to me she's almost a mirror of bond 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 is broken on the inside and he's just a code bastard He's a she like uh, uh, Judy Dench says. You're a weapon I send out to kill people, yeah. and the two of them, you know, 
coming together, they start to, you know, they, they, I hate to put it this way, but they start to heal each other. And given what happens, you know, that I, I almost wish that uh, for at least the two movies after this, they had gone like um, Timothy Dalton did, where, where Bond's just a cold blooded killer and he doesn't care, you know, and that might even be his greatest advantages. So, okay. You want to kill me? So what? Bam, bam. I killed to it. You know, he's just a cold killer. And it's because, you know, his wife was killed right in front of him and there was nothing he could do. Who's your favorite Bond of all time? Um, Timothy Dalton. He's the closest to the novels. And, And Connery even said that he was the best actor to play Bond. But Connery's so charming that if I had to choose an actor to play James Bond from any period, I'd, I'd choose Connery. Butch? I, I can't say it any better. I agree with everything he just said. I, I've said many times, Timothy Dalton, God bless him, if he just had better scripts, and you know, that's not on him. Um, he, he, yeah, he's, he, you know, he... His strengths play to this role, and he's a good actor. I, I, I love everything I've seen him in since then. League of uh, not League of Story Dread, I know Jones, Penny Dreadful, uh, comes to mind, and it's it's, it's I, which I think is kind of funny if you've ever seen it. He's basically playing um, Alan Quartermain, so it's like hell. Oh, look, he's following Sean Connery into another role. Yeah, yeah. Timothy Dalton is probably the best. Uh, it, it's like there's three. Uh, Roger Moore was the first James Bond I ever knew, so there's a little bit of sentimental favorite there. Connery has some of the best scripts, some of the best movies. He's charming, and then you know, but Timothy Dalton, I don't know what I go break that frame. He's probably the best actor and plays the character the way closer to the way uh, Ian Fleming wrote it. Joel. Our number one is all the same, Timothy Dalton. Yeah, I mean, yeah. God, I don't feel his movies are actually bad. Maybe that's just me, uh, but I love Timothy Dalton after though too. He sells his ass off in his movies. I mean, he just told Cole when they said light. When you think when I think license to kill, and I don't mean just the movie. My first face that pops into my mind is Timothy Dalton. Sure. Like, <clears throat> so I don't think it's his movies are bad. I just don't think they're good. And the, I mean, by then you've done what twenty of them, close to twenty of them. I mean, you you should know what you're doing. And it's like they were clueless. Oh, wait, Russia's gone. What do we do? Imagine, imagine him and Golden Eye. That's he what I was got, literally just like, thinking. Like if he had gotten, yeah. he, my God. Okay, now I've got to ask this: what what is what is your favorite Bond film? Uh, Patrick said on His Majesty, he can correct me, but he said this is his favorite Bond. But it, what what is your favorite Bond film? It's corny because it's the first reveal Blofeld. You only live twice. Hmm. I mean, I'll, look, I respect the hell out of Donald Pleasant so much, and not just because he was in Halloween. I knew a lot about his career after watching Halloween, but I just the fact that he has been impactful in two franchises, Bond and Halloween, is just awesome. And the fact that they chose him to be the one who reveals what Blowfield looks like and all that shit. Ah. Are you sticking with Magic Secret Service? Patrick, Patrick. I'm sorry, what? Are, are you sticking with Honor Majesty Secret yeah. Service? Okay. It, yeah, actually, Joel chose mine also. Uh, you Only Live Twice. Uh, That's a great movie. It's it's fun, you know. It's like a uh, doll movie. It, uh, Patrick hit on something I, I, I've been trying to formulate in the back of my mind. I think that's where the... Um, Daniel Craig films started to make a mistake. They they weren't fun. And I'm not saying it's got to be, oh, look, here's Roger Moore slipping on a banana peel. Not that he ever did that, but 
there should be a little bit of fun and rather than my god this guy's kind of depressing Man. yeah uh, yeah maybe that was you know if if they had been building towards that bonds code he's dead inside you know yeah we we have to pump him up on antidepressants to get him to do a job or whatever okay but to me it wasn't anything they were trying to do it was just <sighs> yeah. is there anything you guys want to add about on her majesty's secret service it's a great movie. Go see it. Yeah, it is. Ten out of ten. Great. Movie. Yeah. Um, it's you know, um, it, I was kind of expecting not to like it. Uh, just you know, things I've said, and I I tried to go into it with zero expectations and just you know sit sit back and watch the story they wanted to tell me, and you know I enjoyed it. Um, I agree with Patrick. I think if if uh, Lazenby continued, he could have he could have been the you know we'd all be talking about uh, Lazenby and then going what was that first guy? What was his name? Seen something? Hey, I do have a quick question for you, Patrick. Do you still have your Lazenby uh, autograph somewhere? Somewhere. <laughs> somewhere. What What are you doing tomorrow, Butch? Um, going to buy a dishwasher because <laughs> ours died. <laughs> so, so you wouldn't be able to hop on a podcast with us tomorrow night, or yeah? uh, what? Usual time? Yeah, nine forty-five. Uh, what you got? Have I seen it? Uh, well, it's my number five on my Christmas list. It's called Dark Angel. I come in peace. It's all stuff London. Oh yeah, I've saw that. It's been a long time. Yeah. Um, I tell you what, I'll let you know. I'll, I'll shoot you okay. a message tomorrow. Just see how things fall out. Okay. Patrick, you good for tomorrow? I am. I'll see you then. Okay. What uh? Well, no. What are we? Wait, wait. What are we doing in a week? That well, it's that's your pick. Go ahead. That's, that's my pick. Um, we're going to do a redo, and we're going to do Will Penny with Mr. McRae. Okay. All and right. I like that. All you, right. all of you folks, should sit back and be get ready for a really good review because we've all seen it, we like it, and we're going to have the wise, wise Doctor Pretorius over here. He's going to instruct us all, and you should just sit back and listen uh, to him. Uh, I, I'll talk about the butter churn and scene. It, it's called Will Penny Revisited. We're doing a revisited tour. I love it. I love it. And, and this goddamn Charlton Heston. So you're gonna. <laughs> And you know, Donald Pleasant is a mad preacher, Jesus. <laughs> like, it's not a movie you pass on. No, no, uh, guy. First of all, gentlemen, this was a lot of fun to discuss this movie because it is a great Bond movie, it's a Bond movie that people need to appreciate a lot more. So, guys, you have a good night, and I'll see you guys. Hopefully, Butch will join us tomorrow night for Dark Angel. I come in peace. Thank you, Jewel. Yep, see thank you, Jewel. You Thanks, everybody. Bye.